special times, a lot of emotion. And this next introduction I have the honor of doing right now is not going to be very difficult. You're going to be excited about what you're about to hear now and why the challenge of King is more relevant today than it's ever been before. Please welcome Dr. Robert Ross. Wow. Um, so, to first things first, to the board of the Jackie Robinson uh, YMCA, to the staff, to the management, to the volunteers, uh, you all have come a long, long way. And I can't say enough about the dogged, tenacious, loving leadership that Michael Brunker provides this institution and this organization. Stand up, a round of applause for Michael Brunker. Thank you, Michael. <laughs> Dee Sanford, good to see you. Amos, uh, Reverend George Walker Smith, who introduced me to San Diego when I got here through the Catfish Club. Uh, I see my great friend, Ron Roberts. Ron, great to see you. Uh, so many others that um, helped nurture me while I was here in San Diego working for the health department and for the county of San Diego. I, um, I got my, uh, my introduction to this work. I've been in the work of community and health for, for a number of, of years now. And I want to give you a little bit of, of personal reflection about how I got there. Uh, some of you will remember this period of time. Uh, those of you that are under the age of 40 uh, won't appreciate it, and those of you that are over the age of 40 to 50 uh, will. Um, I was a practicing pediatrician for a number of years on the East Coast. In, uh, particularly in Camden, New Jersey, and in, and in North Philadelphia. And this was in the period of time between the mid-1980s and the early 1990s. And um, there was a phenomenon that occurred while I was in practice. Uh, and I love the practice of pediatrics. I love the kids. I love the families. Um, healing children is just a wonderful, wonderful thing. And, and in that vein, in that context, uh, my heart goes to the family of Dr. Richard Butcher, who was a great friend and a great leader here as well. But the phenomenon that happened was crack cocaine. And before 1984, before the invention of crack cocaine, poor people couldn't buy cocaine. It was too expensive. It came in, in denominations of $100 and up, and if you didn't have $100 of ready cash flow in your pocket, you couldn't buy the then powdered form of, of cocaine. Until 1984, when some evil genius invented crack, and all of a sudden, the affordability and the price of cocaine on accessibility to cocaine went from $100 and up down to $5. Now here's, here's I'm gonna give just a minute about the pharmacology of, of, of cocaine, in particular crack cocaine. Cocaine is a short acting, not long acting, a short acting, intensely euphoric drug. It gives you an immense sense of euphoria and well-being, but it's metabolized quickly by the body, and the high only lasts about 20 or 30 minutes. So if you don't have a sense of opportunity, a sense of hope, a sense of well-being with your day-to-day -day life, crack cocaine will give you a 20-minute passport to that sense of euphoria and well-being. It will provide it for you, right? 
But the problem is the high only lasts 20, 20 or 30 minutes, so once you get that hit and you want to have that feeling of well-being and, and euphoria, you, you do it again and you do it again and you do it again and you do it again. And so if you're a young man and you're addicted, come addicted to, to crack cocaine, you steal to support your habit, right? And we saw what happened to inner city, uh, our law enforcement officials know this very well, and, and I see the sheriff is here. Property crimes went through the roof in the 1980s and early 1990s. If you're a young woman and you're addicted to crack cocaine, you sell yourself to support your habit, and at that period in time we saw astronomical skyrocketing increases in chlamydia, gonorrhea, HIV, AIDS, all kinds of sexually transmitted diseases. If you're a young man and you're entrepreneurial, then selling crack became a fast way to make fast money. Right? So we saw this phenomenon and it swept across the nation. Right? Swept across from Camden, Detroit, New York, St. Louis, Oakland, Richmond, San Diego, LA, crack cocaine swept like a phenomenon, an epidemic phenomenon across the country. And it added a layer of hopelessness to, to communities already struggling with hope. So you have to understand, I'm a pediatrician practicing in a community where this is unfolding and how it affected my view of health in the community, and, and I, it was an object lesson for me that hopelessness really is bad for your health. Hopelessness can be lethal for your health. And I remember going attending a lot of crack baby deliveries at that time because women who were addicted to crack cocaine who were pregnant would forget that they were mothers. They would neglect their prenatal care, and also cocaine is a muscular stimulant. It would stimulate the uterus in the woman's body, and babies were being born instead of 40 weeks gestation or nine months gestation, being born at 26, 27, 28 weeks gestation. So these were crack babies being born at one pound, a pound and a half, two pounds, and into an atmosphere of, of neglect. So if that wasn't bad enough in terms of this pediatrician, and it was a burning bush moment for me, it, 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 it had me thinking more about public policy and community and the health of children. But if that wasn't bad enough, I also witnessed what the nation's response to the crack cocaine epidemic was. And the nation's policy response came from a narrative. And I want to talk a little bit about narratives today. Because narratives frame choices that we make as a society, and those choices frame whether we are moving closer to social justice and the dream of Martin Luther King, or whether we're moving away from social justice and away from the dream that Dr. Martin Luther King had for us all, right? But the narrative frame that popped up as a result of the crack cocaine epidemic was called three strikes and you're out. It was a bumper sticker on Monday. It became national public policy on Wednesday. And I watched as the nation's public policy response was to criminalize a health problem. The problem of hopelessness and addiction is a public health problem. And instead of a national response of a buildup of mental health services and substance abuse treatment, a public health response, our nation built jails and built prisons. And we criminalized hopelessness and addiction. And so since the 1980s, since the crack cocaine epidemic and three strikes and you're out, the nation saw a 430% increase in the prison population across the nation between then and, uh, and the early tw uh, tw uh, 2000s. Right? 
in the state of California during that period of time, the state of California built 22 new prisons and one new university campus. 22 prisons, one new UC campus. And so that all emanated from the narrative frame of three strikes and you're out. It wasn't a prevention narrative, it was a punishment narrative. And so I just wanted to, to share that with you because the power of framing and narrative still plagues our nation and still gets in the way of achieving Dr. Martin Luther King's dream. You can have positive narratives and you can have negative narratives and certainly three strikes and you're out. The state of California has done a lot in recent years to begin to unpack that punishment narrative and start replacing it with a, with a prevention narrative. And even our police chiefs and sheriffs and, and district attorneys now agree we can't arrest our way into community safety, can we not? That we have to have smarter and better alternatives than that. And so California is beginning to show the nation what dismantling a punishment narrative and replacing it with a prevention and support narrative can do. I bring that up because our nation is now struggling with another kind of narrative problem. And right now, our nation is quite conflicted. And I'm not gonna talk about Trump versus Clinton or Democrats versus Republicans or conservatives versus liberals or that's, that's not the point of, of this conversation this morning. I want you to think about the narratives that we've heard and ask ourselves, does that narrative move us closer to the dream of Martin Luther King or move it away from it? And I am deeply concerned and troubled by the narrative we saw unveil itself in this past election campaign. And that was a narrative of exclusion. You can have a narrative of inclusion, which is what we're about here this morning, and you can have a narrative of exclusion, a narrative of scapegoating, a narrative of blame, a narrative of finger pointing that in no way is consistent with the, with the dream of Dr. Martin Luther King. And so the nation's soul seems to be at a pivot point right now on this issue of inclusion versus exclusion. And if you're here at this breakfast this morning and have been attending for year after year after year, I know what you believe. You believe in a narrative of inclusion and a narrative of compassion and a narrative of, of a broad human circle of concern and not a narrow human cir uh, circle of concern. California generally, San Diego in particular, LA, same challenge. Where the nation is right now, we will not be able to look to Washington DC or either other communities to show us the way towards Dr. Martin Luther King's dream. We will have to get there and forge that path on our own. There is no playbook, there is no manual, there is no toolkit for us to get there. We're gonna to have to get there through our own leadership. Right? And California, in an interesting way, is at least 10 to 20 years ahead of the rest of the nation. Shortly after I arrived in California, there was Prop 187, Prop 209, Prop 227, you had three strikes and you're out. California was in a very different place. California was, was flirting with the exclusion narrative in the early to mid 1990s, was it not? Anti-immigrant, anti, you know, three strikes and you're out. And we're in, a, we're in a very different place in the state of California right now. 
And even though, and I'm going to get to the issue of policing shortly, but even though there continue to be, continue, continues to be a need for a lot of work to get done with in, in the space between communities and police departments, the LAPD, the San Diego PD, law enforcement has come a long way in the state of California over the last 20 or 30 years. So we here, you here in San Diego, don't, don't look to Washington for ideas about achieving Dr. King's narrative. We will have to plot that path ourselves. And the work of, of the Jackie Robinson YMCA and this breakfast is a reminder for all of us to hitch up our suspenders and pull up our pants and get to the work of inclusion. You can't talk about Dr. King without invoking the matter of justice, and you can't talk about justice without invoking the matter in this nation at this time of policing and community. And I want to raise the issue of police shootings for a moment. Because I want to give you a different narrative for thinking about that very uncomfortable problem that we have. So let's think about a fictitious police shooting case, the details of which will be familiar to all of us. Let's talk about 26-year-old African-American male whose name is Malik, who was shot and killed in an encounter with police on Euclid Avenue outside of liquor store. The story was that Malik was uh, in the liquor store and he purchased his bottle of liquor. He got into an argument with the store owner about how much change he thought he was due. Words escalated. Altercation ensues. Spills out into the front of the liquor store and 911 is called. Police officers arrive and find Malik outside the liquor store acting erratically and violently. They direct Malik to drop to his knees and put his hands on his head. Malik refuses, continues to be erratic, and he also has his right hand in his waistband, waistband of his pants. Officer Garcia, six-year veteran of the force, the lead officer on the scene. He's got twin three-year-old girls at home. And there is a tense, taut standoff between Malik acting erratically, Officer Garcia and his fellow officers. In a moment, Officer Garcia is thinking about whether he's going to see his three-year-old girls at home that night. Malik continues to refuse to obey the officer's orders. Malik makes a sudden move with his right hand in his waistband. There is a glitter of a shiny object in his right hand, Officer Garcia fires his weapon, and Malik is felled. The shiny object in his waistband turns out to be a cell phone. Now, what will happen in the ensuing days and weeks, we've seen this story, right? where appropriately there'll be a review, there'll be an investigation, there'll be protests, there'll be anger, there'll be vitriol. 
and the appropriate investigation will go on as to whether Officer Garcia acted properly and with justification as he fired his weapon at Malik. But let me tell you about Malik for a minute. So Malik, when he was three years old, his father was incarcerated for selling drugs. At the age of six, he was sexually abused by his stepfather. At the age of eight, he was tested for grade level reading proficiency at his school and he was found to be reading well below grade level reading proficiency. In fifth grade and sixth grade, he began missing a lot of days of school. In seventh grade and eighth grade, he was suspended from school on a number of occasions for defiant behavior and fighting. After the ninth grade, he dropped out. On his 15th birthday, he was arrested with some buddies for attempting to rob a convenience store and then went on to a juvenile hall, spent a couple of years in juvie. Uh, when he came out, he became homeless, drug addicted, and he became a paranoid schizophrenic. So that's Malik's story. Now, what will happen is that the hyper-focus about community outrage on the shooting of Malik will be front page, six o'clock news. And I'm not here to defend whether Officer Garcia fired his weapon justifiably or not. I don't know that. I'm not a law enforcement official. I'm just telling you what happened. And there will be calls for Officer Garcia's termination. There will be calls for the chief of the police to resign. There will be, there'll be protests. And then Officer Garcia will be the one on trial. When his father failed him, his elementary school failed him, his middle school failed him, the mental health system failed him, the health system failed him. The fact that the state of California has a budget, a line item budget for about 11 or $12 billion for prisons and jails and no line item budget for youth prevention, support, community supports, the great kind of work that the Jackie Robinson YMCA does on the goodwill, Michael, of the folks who donate. But no, no, state, no state budgeted line item for prevention and support for, for Malik. And so it unnerves me when the media and many of us hyper-focus on that shooting when there's a whole lot of accountability that goes around about what happened to young Malik. Completely, 100% preventable did not have to happen. And the only time that Malik gets that attention is when a bullet pierces his chest at the age of 26. And so the narrative that you see on MB and MSNBC and on Fox News is the narrative of a false choice. And the false choice is, do black lives matter or do blue lives matter? The answer to that question, ladies and gentlemen, is yes. Yes. Not A or B. And so we have to be careful falling into that narrative of false choices of black lives matter versus blue lives matter. 
because it's, it's not productive for communities. Yes, police departments have work to do around building trust between community and their, and their departments and their officers. But also, yes, communities want a positive, meaningful relationship with their, with their law enforcement officials and police departments. And so it's not either or, it's both and, right? And so with Malik, the, let me take you to med school just for a minute. The neurophysiologic explanation of what happened to Malik was childhood trauma, toxic stress, and adversity. And the science on this is very clear. The more doses of exposure to childhood stress and trauma that you have, the worse your life and your health is going to be. And the data shows that if you have three or more episodes of exposure to toxic stress and trauma, like sexual abuse of a young child, or an incarcerated or deported parent, or witnessing a drive-by shooting, the more doses of that you're exposed to, the higher your likelihood of going to jail, being addicted to cigarettes, being addicted to drugs, being addicted to, to, uh, to alcohol, obesity, hypertension. But our grandparents said, there's a lot of wisdom in our grandparents, but when they told us that, you know, time heals all wounds, not true. The science tells us that that's not true. That childhood stress, toxic stress, exposure to these kind of traumatic events can affect your health, not just in the immediate, but even 30 years later. And how does it work? It works because of something called the fight or flight response that we're all wired with from the time we were cavemen. When we perceive a threat, Certain hormones get elaborated by the back, the, in the back of your brain, the hypothala uh, hypothalamus in the pituitary gland. It shoots out cortisol and adrenaline. You see a threat. If it's a saber-toothed tiger and you got to run, there's a threat, right? Or if someone's attacking your child, that's a threat. And you mobilize. And blood flows through your muscles and your blood pressure goes up, your heart rate increases, your pupils dilate, the hair stands on your end, and that's called the fight-or-flight response. It's a protective response from an immediate threat right? Or immediate stress or immediate trauma. But too many of those do bad things to the brain. It impairs the child's ability, the developing child's ability to have the rational part of the brain process information in terms of behavior. Okay? We've all had this as human beings. When somebody in your family gets you so mad that you lose it, you know, I just lost it, right? What you're losing is your, your frontal cortex, right? It, you, it goes offline, and, that, and then that, that, that stress response kicks in. That's how, but we grow up and we learn how to, you know, this is why for most of us, when somebody cuts you off on the freeway, you don't follow that person home and, and get in a fight, right? So, 400% increase in prison population. At the same time, since three strikes and you're out, we saw something in schools called zero tolerance. And we saw a 350% increase in school suspensions. Once you are suspended from school, even one time, the data tells us that you're at a higher likelihood for dropping out of school than ending up in juvie. So back to Malik, incarcerated parent, sexually abused, not reading well in school. By the way, 70 to 75 percent of black boys in the United States of America in the third grade are reading at less than grade level proficiency. Let me say that to you again. 70 to 75 percent of black boys in the third grade in the United States of America are reading at less than grade level proficiency. And you know that if you don't have that foundation of reading early in life, it is going to haunt you for the rest of your life. Right? You know that. 
So Malik, by missing a lot of school, by getting suspended, by showing up defiant, was screaming for help. Screaming for help. No, he didn't go down to the principal's office and say, you know what, my, hy my hypothalamic pituitary axis is all messed up because I got abused when I was six years old and my father got incarcerated and I'm really having some you know, cortisol stress issues. That's not how Malik is gonna show up. He's gonna show up acting out and fighting in school and being defiant and being disengaged. And so, I want to leave you with that thought. Sure, let's make sure we hold our police departments accountable and let's make sure we do the work of building community and police trust. But we got to go upstream, folks. Our outrage around the fact that our black and brown boys in particular are not reading in the third grade should be front page news. Our outrage that troubled children are being suspended out of school. I mean, every grandmother knows the worst thing that you can do to a child acting up in school is to send them out into the streets. Our outrage that the state of California has an $11 billion budget for prisons and jails and nothing for youth uh, and prevention community supports. That's outrageous. And so the work of, of us in California and you here in San Diego is the right kind of narrative that gives us the right kind of choices. A narrative of inclusion, not exclusion. A narrative of health and wellness and prevention and support. A narrative of prevention over punishment. A narrative that says no to racism, no to sexism, no to anti-LGBT, uh, no to anti-Muslim, no to the politics of exclusion, and yes to the embrace of love and compassion for all and that this country can do better by Dr. Martin Luther King's dream. And it is the work of the Jackie Robinson YMCA that does that. Thank you, Michael, and all that staff, day in and day out to make sure that those young Maliks fall under the support of Coach Jeff. Thank you, Coach Jeff. What if young Malik at the age of 13 had had an opportunity to be in, in, in Coach Jeff's basketball team. What a different outcome, right? And those kinds of programs and supports are not a luxury for our young people. They need to be available for every child who needs that kind of support. So as I close, I just want each and every one of you to think not just about what you're going to do. What is the one thing you're going to do this year? that contributes to Dr. Martin Luther King's narrative of inclusion and justice. What did you not do last year that you're going to do this year? And then what are we and you here in San Diego as a community going to do differently to get us to that narrative of inclusion? And to show this nation, this nation needs to see unity and compassion and love and inclusion. I need to see it playing out and we need it really, really badly. San Diego, you're just gonna have to show this nation the way that this can be a, a, a nation of prosperity for everybody through love and compassion and inclusion. So what are y'all still doing sitting here? Get to it, thank you. All right. Well, 
On behalf of the, the Jackie Robinson Family YMCA and the YMCA of San Diego County, it is a pleasure. Very powerful message. And a lot of the things you covered is one of the reasons why I volunteer and serve on the board of the Jackie Robinson YMCA and the YMCA of San Diego County. So on behalf of those groups, I want to present you with that and also with your own uh, jersey with your name on it, Dr. Ross, with Jackie Robinson's number. So thank you so much. I appreciate that. Thank you. Very powerful. Very, very powerful. I think all of us, and the reason why we're here, something set us on this chart, charted us on this path, sorry. And I can think about a number of different things that charted me on my path. Um, and I'm sure Dr. Martin Luther King, there was a lot of things that charted him on his path that allowed him and enabled him and inspired and encouraged him and inspired him to do what he did. So um, I'm here to thank everybody um, for being here, for all that you do, uh, for the YMCA, and for your communities. So after thanking Dr. Ross for such a powerful message, hopefully we will think on that let it marinate and, and think about what we can do to move toward Dr. King's legacy here in 2017.